to Grokket's OGTV, GMAT edition, where we go through every question in the official guide, give you the answers and explanations, and show our work. Uh, my name is Jim Jacobson, and we are going to pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we left off on page 26 <clears throat> with question number 39 in the data sufficiency questions at the beginning. So page 26, question number 39. Still data sufficiency, so we always want to have our answer choices down. Again, on the real GMAT, you may run into things that you've never seen before, so it's always valuable to have answer choices crossed off, so that if you have to guess, if you find yourself spending too much time on a particular question, you can improve your odds of guessing by not accidentally choosing something that you've logically eliminated. So number 39, in the xy plane, if line k has negative slope and passes through the point negative 5 and r, is the x-intercept of line k positive? So of course we're dealing with an xy, we're dealing with the plane, coordinate plane, Cartesian coordinates. And we know that uh, line k has a negative slope. Remember that lines that have a negative slope go down and to the right. Positive slope, so this is negative slope, a positive slope goes in the other direction. We don't actually know the slope of the line, we just know that it passes through the point negative 5 r. So we 2, 3, 4, 5. So here's negative 5 on the x-axis. We don't know where point r is on the y-axis, so it could be above or below. So without knowing where it is, um, there's several different places that this line could go. So we won't actually know uh, whether the x-intercept of the line is positive. For example, the line could go like this, um, or the line could go like this. So if, if r is a very high positive number, it could be high enough that it um, passes through a pos through the x-axis on the positive side if, if r is a lower number, or even if it's a negative number, it could be all the way down there, um, down here, anything. We just know that it passes through the point negative 5 and r, so r could be above or below the x-axis, and significantly above or below the x-axis. So we need some more information about point R, really, or about the line, um, to determine whether it, uh, whether the x-intercept is positive. Let's take a look at the statements. So statement one, on its own, the slope of, the, of line k is negative 5, which is useful. Remember that um, the slope of a line is the rise over run, the change in y over the change in x. So a slope of negative 5 is the same thing as, you know, uh, 5 over 1. And we know it's a negative slope. So it goes down 5 for every 1 that it goes over to the, to the right. So it's a relatively steep line, um, down 5 units, um, but still uh, with a sufficiently low value for r, r being the y-coordinate of um, the one point that we have, um, it still won't have a positive x-intercept. Again, it could look something like, uh, let's just label these, 1, 2, 3. So it could look anything like uh, drawings 1 or, or 3 here, where um, no matter what the line actually looks like, um, given a low enough value for r, um, it's not going to cross the x-intercept in a positive place, whereas if, it, if r is a very positive number, a very high number, you know, 1 million or something, it will easily um, be on the positive side of the x-axis. So knowing the slope alone is not enough for us to determine sufficiency. So statement 1 on its own is insufficient. We can cross off 1 from our list of statements here. We can also cross off the idea that either one is sufficient on its own. If one isn't sufficient, we can't say that either of them is sufficient. We're left with evaluating statement 2 and the statements in conjunction. Statement 2 tells us that r is greater than 0, which is helpful. We, it absolutely needs to be greater than 0 for us to have a uh, positive x-intercept. But being greater than 0 isn't enough um, 
for example, if it's just to uh, use an example, um, choice number one, drawing number one that I drew before, um, r is clearly above the y-axis, so r is greater than zero, or excuse me, above the x-axis, um, but the line is still steep enough that it never crosses the x-axis on the positive side. Whereas a line with a different slope, something that looks more, much more gradual, it could go like this with a positive value for r. Um, we'll call that drawing four. So that one also uh, is insufficient on its own because without knowing the slope of the line, it's still not enough. So now we have to evaluate the two statements in conjunction knowing that the slope of the line is negative 5 um, and knowing that r is positive I think from the drawings that we've had so far even this is not sufficient we would need to actually pin the value down of r quite a bit more with a slope of negative 5 the value of r would actually have to be over 25 so it would have to be over 25 units up on this you know have to be way up here for a slope of negative 5 to um, go all the way down and cross um, the x-axis on the positive side. But since we don't know the value of r, we just know that it's greater than zero, with that slope of negative five, there's still um, many possible, so we can just draw parallel lines here. Those are two possible values for our line k. Um, and so basically, even in conjunction, the two statements are not sufficient. Sorry, I forgot to cross off this guy. So together, even evaluated together, the two statements are insufficient. Number 40, also on page 26. So if $5,000 invested for one year at P% percent simple annual interest yields $500, what amount must be invested at K% percent simple annual interest for one year to yield the same number of dollars? So we are given uh, that that actual number of dollars. It sounds like it might be asking for something that it isn't. Um, so in this case, we know then, so the formula for simple interest is that the interest on that money equals the principal times the rate times the time. And we're given basically all but one of these. So we know for the original statement, the interest was $500. We were also given the principal of 5,000. We don't actually know the rate, the rate is P, um, and the time is one year, so we can just leave that as one. So that ends up not really being a factor. So uh, that leaves us with 5,000, or 500 equals 5,000 times P. P, why did I put P? I'm sorry, that's R. Well, it's P, I'm sorry, you're right. It's P uh, is the, confusingly, P is the value that they give for the rate. Um, P percent. Okay, so um, we look at this and we say, well, what what percent interest of 5,000 gives us 500? Pretty clearly, P here, P percent, the rate of interest is 10. So we need to find out then uh, what amount must be invested at K percent, a different percent interest, at simple annual interest for one year to yield the same number of dollars? So our new equation is going to be 500, and we don't know the principal on this one, times whatever k percent is times the time, which is also going to be one year, so we can leave that one alone. Now it's time to look at the statements. Statement 1, on its own, tells us that k equals 0.8p. Well, p was 10%, percent point eight of 10% is 8%. So um, we are left with a new equation. We can fill in everything else that we need. We still don't know that principle. Um, times 8% times 1. 
And from here, we have one equation and one variable. We know that we could figure it out. Um, it actually turns out that p equals 6,250. But remember, with data sufficiency, your goal is just to, to stop when you know that you could figure it out without, without actually figuring it out. When there's no ambiguity, when it's simply a matter of you know, multiplication, addition, um, subtraction, or division, and you know you could find the answer, you have sufficiency with that statement. Oh, Sufficient on its own. So statement two, ignoring statement, so we can cross off... Um, statement two on its own, we can cross off together, and we can cross off neither. Um, so we are, we've got our odds down to 50% just on the basis of that one statement. Statement two tells us that k equals eight. Well, if that sounds familiar, that's because it is. Um, statement one told us exactly the same thing, that uh, k was 80% of p, which happened to be eight. Uh, statement two tells us flat out that k equals eight, so we are left with exactly the same equation p times 8 times 1. p again equals 6,250, but we don't want to do that math because this is data sufficiency. The statement 2 is sufficient, crossing off statement 1 alone, leaving us with either one being sufficient on its own. Number 41 on page 26. So if the quantity x plus y over z, um, if the quantity x plus y all over z is greater than 0, is x greater than 0? So we're worried about this guy. x plus y over z is greater than zero. Is x greater than zero? So one thing we know without even without even doing any looking at statements or anything like that is that we can deduce some things about x and y or z. In order for this fraction to be greater than zero, the numerator and the and the denominator need to have the same sign. So we need basically either um, x plus y and z, both of them need to be greater than zero, because then it's a positive number. Or, if we have a negative number over a negative number, that is also a positive number. So we could also have x plus y and z less than zero. Both of those need to be true. I mean, th there's no other way that the, that the given statement could be correct unless that is true. So that can save us some time later on when we get to the statements. So, uh, statement one on its own, x is less than y. Well, um, that's somewhat useful, but it doesn't give us any information about the actual value of x. We need to determine whether x is less than zero. The only way we can determine whether x is less than zero is whether we know, you know, if we're dealing with positives and negatives um, on, on on both halves of the fraction that we're given. So knowing those two relative to each other doesn't tell us whether x is greater or less than zero. So statement one on its own doesn't give us enough information to tell us about x other than it's less than y. Statement two on its own, z is less than zero. This is more revealing. Uh, if z is less than zero, it's a negative number. And remember, we have to take the original uh, question stem as a given that the whole thing is greater than zero. So if z is less than zero, then if z is less than zero, then x plus y, that, that quantity, is also less than zero. Both of them need to be negative for the entire fraction to be positive. Um, but knowing that x plus y is less than zero still does not tell us whether x itself is less than zero. x could be something like one, and y could be negative 30 million, um, and then we would be left with a, a negative fraction, which is what we need for, for um, the entire thing to be positive. But it, and 
but conversely, the numbers could be reversed. X could be negative 30 million and Y could be 1. So statement 2 on its own, insufficient for us to determine uh, whether X itself is greater than 0. So here, then, we are left um, with doing the 2 in conjunction. Sorry, so statement 1 on its own, either, and statement 2 on its own have been crossed off. We're left with the two answer choices that uh, involve looking at the two statements together. The two of them together. So we know then that uh, x plus y uh, must be less than zero because we know that we determined that here. So of the two options, we can cross off this over here that they're both positive. We know that they're both negative from statement two. So that means that x plus y is less than zero. Um, we also know then that x um, is less than y from statement one. Inequalities can be treated the same way as equations in some ways. As long as you're not multiplying or dividing by a negative number, you can add and subtract numbers from both sides um, and multiply and divide by positive numbers, leaving the sign the same. So we know that x is less than the opposite of y. We can subtract um, y from both sides of the, or the inequality there. So we have x is less than the opposite of y and also x is less than y. We can actually treat these two like they are equations and you may remember it from the combination method when you have two equations and variables. One of the methods is uh, combining them rather than substituting them. You can actually just add the two equations together. So we can just add these two inequalities. We end up with 2x is less than 0, y plus negative y equals 0, x plus x equals 2x. Divide both sides by 2, x itself is less than 0. Let's divide by 2. So with x being less than 0, we can definitively answer yes to this question, and since the answer is always yes, the two statements together are sufficient. Third choice. So page 26, number 42. Does the integer k have at least three different positive prime factors? Not much prediction we can do about this one. Uh, we need to know something about the integer k, and we need to differentiate again uh, different positive prime factors as you know from uh, just the total number of prime factors but aside from that we really do just have to dive into the statements so statement one tells us that k over 15 is an integer in order for that to be true in order for dividing k by 15 to result in an even integer k itself must be a multiple of 15. multiples of 15 include things like 15 30 45, 60, etc. Um, in every case, the the factors of 15, the positive prime factors of the factors of 15 are um, 1, 3, 5, and 15. So at the minimum, those are the 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 factors. The only positive prime factors are 3 and 5. So that alone doesn't tell us whether um, integer k has at least three different positive prime factors because if k is 15 itself it only has two different positive prime factors but if k is 30 which is 15 times 2 that adds two maybe I should draw a little line here 30 the prime factors are 1 2 3 5 15 30, leaving us with three prime factors. So since the question was, does it have at least three? Well, if, if the answer is that k is 15, then yes, it does. Um, if it, the answer is that k is 30, then 
or excuse me, if the answer is 15, no, it doesn't have three prime factors. If the answer is k is 30 or more, then yes, it does have at least three prime factors. Because the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no, statement one on its own is insufficient. We can cross off statement one on its own, as well as this notion that either one would be sufficient on its own. Let's take a look at statement two. So statement two tells us that k over 10 is an integer. Similarly to statement one, this tells us that k is a multiple of 10. So uh, k could be 10 itself, or 20, or 30, or 40, and so on. Any number of multiples of 10. If k is 10 itself, its prime, its factors are 1, 2, 5, and 10. In that case, it has exactly two distinct different prime factors. If k is 30, though, its factors are 1, and we actually already have the factors of 30 on the screen, 2, 3, 5, 15, and 30. So in this case, it has three prime factors. So again, we have the answer sometimes yes, sometimes no, depending on what the value of k actually is. So um, sometimes yes, sometimes no on a yes-no question is always insufficient. So we can cross off this idea that statement two on its own is sufficient. Then we're left with the idea of combining the two. Our remaining two answer choices are the combination. So these two together, when you, when you combine things like this, that uh, where you have multiple answers, you look for the overlap. In this case, then, k must be a multiple of both 15 and of 10. The lowest multiple, lowest least common multiple of uh, 15 and 10 is 30. So that tells us that k over 30 is an integer. We've already established that 30 has at least three prime factors. Multiples of 30 could be more. Um, once we get up to 7 times 30, once we get up to 210, um, then we have even four uh, prime factors. But the question is, how does it have at least three prime factors? Since it is a multiple of 30, it does have at least three different prime factors. So these two statements together are sufficient for us to answer the question. We can cross off the neither. It is choice three together the two insufficient statements are sufficient to answer the question. Still on page 26, number 43. In City X last April, was the average daily, temp daily high temperature greater than the median daily high temperature? So for sufficiency, to, in order to answer this question, we actually need to know both that mean, the average, and the median, and then compare the two. Or find out something about the relationship between them without actually finding out those numbers. Either one would, would enable us to answer this question definitively. But they don't give us any of that information in the original question, so we do need to take a look at the statements. Really, there's almost there's never going to be a, a data sufficiency question where they answer it completely in the question, but sometimes you can do some, some work in advance. So statement one tells us, in City X last April, the sum of the 30 daily high temperatures was 2,160 degrees. That's a lot of degrees. We also know that April you know, has 30 days. So we could, if we wanted to, divide 2,160 by 30, and that number is going to be the mean. We don't want to do that yet because we just need to know what, whether, you know, whether this statement is sufficient on its own, and it's not. We needed both the mean and the median to, to determine sufficiency here. So for now, let's save that math for later. Insufficient on its own. We can cross off statement one as well as either the fourth one. Statement two. In City X last April, 60% of the daily high temperatures were less than the average daily high temperature. So for this one, we have to kind of imagine what this looks like as a set. 
So A, B, C, D. All these are different temperatures for the month. I'm not going to write out 30 <laughs> because we'll run out of letters before we run out of days. But let's just imagine it's something like this. And there's imagine that there's 30 numbers there. 60% of the daily high temperatures were less than the average. So that means that the so imagine that these are in, a, in ascending order. The average is something like 60%. It's over here. So 60% of them were less than the average. So there were a few days that were that much warmer than the rest that it skewed the average um, above the middle of the set. And this, of course, actually tells us all the information we need to know. The median is exactly in the middle. With 30 numbers in the set, remember the median is going to be the average of the middle two numbers. When you have an odd number of numbers in the set, it's the middle number. When you have an even number, it's the average of the two in the middle. Um, we know that the average of the entire set, though, is to the right greater than the median because 60% of the temperatures for that month were less than the average. So this one is sufficient on its own to answer the question. The, the average um, was in fact greater than the median daily high temperature. So statement two on its own is sufficient. Okay, page 26, number 44. If m and n are positive integers, is the quantity of the square root of m raised to the n power an integer? So for this one, in order for, so we know that both m and n are positive integers, is the square root of m raised to the n an integer? In order for that to be true, in order to raise something to an integer power and still have that result be an integer, that thing that you're raising to the power needs to be an integer. So what this question is actually asking is, is the square root of m an integer? Or, it may, they may also tell us, is m a perfect square? That would be another way for us to know. If m is a perfect square, its square root is an integer, and raising it to any integer will also result in, in well, raising it to any positive integer will give us another integer. So we need to find some things about m, really. Statement 1 tells us that the square root of m, the quantity of the square root of m, is an integer. That was actually one of the things that we were hoping for. If the square root of m is an integer, and we already know that n is a positive integer, raising that to any power, no matter what n is, I mean, again, within the rules, um, this number, square root of m to the n, is going to itself be an integer. So statement 1 on its own, totally sufficient. It gave us what we needed to know about m, or actually the square root of m. So we can cross off 2 on its own. Um, as well as together and neither. We are left only with, state, with the other option of um, statement two also being sufficient. So statement two tells us that the square root of n is an integer. What this tells us, of course, is that n is a perfect square. Um, but since we're raising, we already knew that n was an integer, and that's what's happening in the original statement, that we're raising the square root of m to the power of n. Um, knowing that the square root of n is also an integer is basically irrelevant. The, the question stem told us that n itself is a positive integer, and that, so knowing mo this additional level of detail about n doesn't give us anything that we could use to determine whether the square root of m raised to a power stays an integer. So statement two on its own insufficient, we can cross off. The option of either, we are left with statement one on its own being sufficient. Page 26, number 45.
So of the 66 people in a certain auditorium, at most, six people have birthdays in any one given month. Does at least one person in the auditorium have a birthday in January? So this one we can do a little bit of thinking before we tackle those statements. So if six, if there are 66 people and at most have six people, if at most six people have birthdays in any one given month, that means that we could actually have one month where none of them have birthdays. So we have 66 people and uh, divide that by six. That means we could actually have 11 months at six people each in each month and one month then with none. If we have even one month that has fewer than six people uh, with a birthday in that month then we would have people spread out over all 12 months. But if the maximum allowed by the problem uh, gives us six in each month then we could actually have uh, at, um, nobody with a birthday in January. So. The big question is, Is do we have every month maxed out, or do we have uh, evidence that there are no birthdays in January? Either one of those would be sufficient. Statement 1. More of the people in the auditorium have birthdays in February than in March. So February is greater than March. What this means for us, though, is that the only way we could spread everyone's birthdays out over the year so that nobody had a birthday in January is if every month had six, except for January, which has none. If February has more than month, more than March, that means that uh, March actually would not have six birthdays in it. So even if we had, you know, for the 11 months, Feb January at 0, February at 6, March at 5, and every other month at 6, which is the maximum allowed, that still leaves us with one extra birthday that we have to put in January. Because this tells us that one month that one month is less than 6, there must be at least one birthday in January. And so that would be sufficient to say yes. So sufficient to tell us yes, at least one person has a birthday in January. Again, because it's only if every month except January has six. So, statement one is an option. Statement two on its own is not, as are the two that have each statement insufficient on its own. Statement two. Five of the people in the auditorium have birthdays in March. This actually looks a lot like the thinking that we just did with um, statement one, but of course we have to put that out of our mind. We're tackling each statement on its own first. If March has five, um, remember the only way that every that we could have zero in January is if is if we actually have six in every remaining month. So just to, I should probably illustrate this. So January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So in order to have zero here, we need six in every month. Any other number other than six in one of those months, and then we have at least one in January, and you know then we can answer our question. So um, if March equals five, we must have one in January to get that 66 total. So March being five is basically the same as statement one telling us that one of them is short, so there's one in January. It's sufficient to tell us, yes, there is at least one person with a birthday in January. It's not just statement one. It is both statements. Either one, either statement is sufficient on its own, on its own and in this case it's sufficient to tell us, yes, there is at least one person with a January birthday. So page 26, number 46. Last year, the average salary of the 10 employees of Company X was $42,800. What is the average salary of the same 10 employees this year? 
So for this one, in order to have sufficiency, we need a number of things. Um, of course, if it just flat out gives us in some kind of complicated expression the average salary of the same 10 employees this year, that would be great. We also could find out um, what the average salary is if we could find out their individual salaries and figure out what their raises were. Um, but just note that the average salary does not mean that everyone is making the average salary, only that if you add up all 10 salaries and divide by 10, that's the number. This could be 10 employees who are all partners and all making the same amount, or it could be one CEO and nine people making significantly less. So let's take a look at those statements. So statement one, for eight of the 10 employees, this year's salary is 15% greater than last year's salary. So eight out of 10, have a 15% increase. This doesn't tell us about the other ones. Um, it actually also doesn't really tell us anything about um, where they are in terms of the salary range. You know, if every employee is um, is making the average salary, so all 10 people are making, well in this case it wouldn't be. If 8 of the 10 were making the average salary from last year, we could compute the 15% increase, but we need to know the actual number, the actual salary of those eight individuals to determine its impact on the average. We also don't have the other two out of ten. So statement one on its own has multiple ways that it's not going to be enough for us. It's insufficient on its own. So we can cross off statement one. We can also cross off either one being sufficient for us because it's missing the two out of ten. Statement two for two of the ten employees, this year's salary is the same as last year's salary. Well, that's that's good, but it gives us the same the same issue. Um, no increase. Two out of ten is great. Uh, it still tell it it doesn't tell us what the actual numbers are. It also leaves out the other eight people out of the ten out of the ten. So uh, multiple things are insufficient about statement two. We can cross off statement two on its own. Now we're left with looking at the two in conjunction. So we know that 8 out of 10 got a 15% increase and 2 out of 10 got no increase. But one of the problems that we had with the original statements was not only that we didn't have the full 10. So on this one we now have what happened with all 10 employees. We know that 8 out of 10 got a 15% increase and 2 got none. However, we don't know which employees those were and on what salaries those were based. So again, if every employee was making uh, 42800 then we would actually be able to figure out exactly um, what the new average salary is. We would do a weighted average and we would figure out a 15% increase on eight-tenths of it and, and we, we could go from there. Um, however, what if we have one, empl one, one employee who's making $100,000 a year, and then we have a bunch of other employees that are making a much lower amount. So all at 42800 is very different from 9 at some low number. Sorry for not figuring it out in advance what, <laughs> what number we would actually need to get to uh, come up with that average of 42800 But if one person is making 100000 and the other 9 are dragging the average down to 42800 it matters which eight people got a 15% increase and which two got none. If the person making 100,000 is one of the 15% people, um, that changes. That gives us a different average for all 10 people than if the, the 100,000 person gets no increase. So again, without knowing any of these actual dollar values, um, just knowing the, the increases, the proportional increases, doesn't tell us what the new average salary is going to be. So even in conjunction, our two statements are insufficient. Choice E or the fifth one. Okay, so page 26, number 47. So in a certain classroom, there are 80 books, of which 24 are fiction and 23 are written in Spanish. How many of the fiction books are written in Spanish? 
And at first, this is, I mean, the, to some extent, this is a question of overlapping sets. And so it's kind of tempting to immediately uh, go to the Venn diagram, you know, the overlapping circles here. But in this case, we're actually left with two different uh, overlapping sets. So, you know, in a normal overlapping sets problem, we have one that's in category A, one that's in category B, and some that are in both. Here we have two different um, splits. We have the split between Spanish and non-Spanish, and the, sp the split between fiction and non-fiction. Um, so in this particular case, we are actually much better off... I'm just going to erase... The, well, no, I can do it over here. We're better off doing a chart to keep track of... Or a chart or a grid. We have Spanish and non-Spanish. And then we have fiction and non-fiction. Your handwriting may be better on the GMAT, as long as you can read what you wrote and as long as you can read what I wrote, we'll be okay. All right, so we know from the original question that we have a total of 24 fiction. And we also know that we have a total of 23 written in Spanish. And we have a total of 80. We can do a little bit of deduction from here. Um, 23 plus x here uh, is uh, 80, so then that means there must be 57 um, that are non-Spanish. If 23 are Spanish, 57 are non-Spanish. Conversely, if 24 are fiction, we know that 56 must be non-fiction. But the numbers uh, in the ways that those overlap is not necessarily clear, and that's where the statements come in. So we do a big x. No Venn diagram on this one. The numbers we could figure out were that one, or the numbers we were given were these, and we figured out the rest. So, statement one. Statement one tells us for eight of the ten, Im oh, sorry, <laughs> that's the wrong one. Uh, statement one tells us of the fiction books, there are six more that are not written in Spanish than are written in Spanish. So, if we say that X is the number of those that are written in Spanish, then we know that x plus 6 is the number that are non-Spanish. So statement 1 tells us that x plus x plus 6 equals 24. So subtract 6 from both sides. Uh, x plus x equals 18. 2x equals 18. x equals 9. Um, and of course, if you saw immediately that you could solve for x there, um, then you wouldn't have actually had to do this math. You could just say, oh, psh, sufficient, you know. Um, and so this one is a value question. It does tell us that x equals 9. Uh, the question was actually asking. We always want to verify that we solve for the right thing. This, was, this question was asking uh, how many of the fiction books are written in Spanish, so that's why we chose x here. Um, so statement 1 is sufficient on its own, so we can get rid of uh, to get, uh, statement 2 on its own, the two together, as well as neither. Statement 2 on its own, we have to pretend we don't have that number there, um, tells us that of the books written in Spanish, there are five more nonfiction books than fiction books. This may look kind of familiar. Then we also know then that um, we can do it kind of vertically. Five more are non nonfiction. So X, the Spanish books, plus the nonfiction Spanish books equals 23. Once again, this ends up being x plus x equals 18, and so 2x equals 18, and x equals 9. Again, uh, if you can, you should stop as soon as you get to this point, because you know that you're you could solve for x, even if it ends up being a fraction, a decimal, um, which doesn't seem likely when we're talking about books, but just knowing that all you have is addition, subtraction, and a single variable, that is enough for you to determine sufficiency. So this one is also sufficient to tell us. We can cross off statement one on its own. Either one is sufficient on its own to tell us how many books, how many fiction books are written in Spanish. Okay.
last one. Last one of the data sufficiency in this section anyway. So we're on page 26 still. Last one is question number 48. So, oh, got to get the answers up there. If P is the perimeter of rectangle Q, what is the value of P? So first we should draw a rectangle for ourselves. So rectangle Q. And remember that rectangles can actually be squares. Rectangle just means that it, it's a figure with four right angles. So in theory, it could also be a square. Pretend that's a square. But in any case, we know that the perimeter of any one of these figures is the, um, the sum of the two sides. Um, so we have the length and the width. So the perimeter is 2 times the length plus 2 times the width. We don't have any of that information from the question stem, of course, so we're going to get something from the statements. Okay. So, uh, statement 1, on its own, tells us that each diagonal of rectangle Q has a length of 10. So we know diagonal here is 10. Remember that um, because we're dealing with a, um, a rectangle, every one of the corners is a right angle, a 90 degree angle, like so. What this means is that when we have the diagonal, we actually have two right triangles. And we can use the Pythagorean theorem to determine a little bit of information. Remember that the Pythagorean theorem tells us that the, um, the square of the hypotenuse of the triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. And in this case, the diagonal of a rectangle is going to be that hypotenuse. So we know then that the two other sides of our rectangle are a squared plus b squared equals 10. Um, and from there, we know then that 10 equals the square root of those two together. We can take the square root of each. Well, we square both sides first, then we can go back down. So we know that um, d equals b squared plus b squared. In this case, um, 10 is the length squared plus the width squared, or 100, excuse me. Ugh. 100 equals the square of the length plus the square of the width. Now, we, d we can't actually solve from there, though, because we don't know what these respective values are. Um, in this particular case, you know, it, it looks tempting to have the two numbers be integers. So we could, for example, have two numbers that add up to be for, uh, to add up to be 100. So we could have, um, oh, you know, any two. But keep in mind that these could be square roots. So we could have 75 and 25. So the square root of the one would equal five. The square root of the other would be five times the square root of five. Sorry, five, five times the square root of three. Um, and in this case, um, because there's more than one value that we can choose for the length or the width, um, that statement one is not going to be sufficient on its own. We know that the two together equal um, 100, but we don't actually know what the individual values are. And there's any number of numbers that you can add together to equal 100. So statement one on its own, insufficient to give us the answer. So we get rid of that one. We can also get rid of either one being sufficient on its own. Statement two, the area of rectangle Q is 48. So let's just draw a sample here. There's actually a couple different values that this could give us. So the area is 48. Remember that area equals the length times the width. So we need two numbers that are factors of 48. That could be something as easy as 6 times 8. It could also be something as strange as 1 times 48. Without knowing what the actual lengths and widths are, as with statement 1, uh, we get multiple values for the perimeter of the rectangle Q. So again, 
um, statement two on its own is insufficient. Now we have to evaluate the two together. With the two of them together though, we actually have some possibilities here. Let's clear out a little space here. So we know that the area equals the length times the width. Uh, and so, and we also know what that area is. So the width of the, of the rectangle Q is 48 divided by that length because length times width equaled, equaled 48. Have that over here. We can also use that then to substitute into the other equation that we had. So we had 100, this is the one we got from statement one, 100 equals the length squared plus that width squared. Now from here we could say to ourselves um, we have sufficiency because we, we're down to one variable with um, one equation so we know that we can solve it but we can be thorough here and just do it the rest of the way. If we multiply both sides by uh, L squared we get rid of the fraction. Um, the fraction on the right here so we get 100 L squared equals L to the fourth that's a big number squaring 48, but it ends up being um, 2,304. Then we can actually convert this into something that looks more like a polynomial. So we can have L to the fourth minus 100 L squared plus 2,304 equals zero. Remember we set it to zero and then we can figure out the factors. Um, so the two factors are going to be L squared minus 64 and L squared minus 36. From there we know that L squared is either 64 or 36. That corresponds to the values that we had over here, a 6 by 8 rectangle. Again, if you're confident with your algebra and know that you could solve a, an equation here, since we're dealing with measurements, we wouldn't have any negative roots. You could just stop here and say that the two statements that this that this is going to be enough for sufficiency, and so together the two statements are sufficient. And I think we should stop there. Uh, we're, the next section is reading comprehension, and I want to make sure that you have enough time to read it when we go over them. So we will pick up next time. Um, on page 27. This has been 